All right, Book of Micah tonight. Book of Micah. Uh, we, used to have, we used to have a lot of these um, Bible study sessions in our church services, and then we started the Bible school, and that took a lot of the Bible study uh, part of it and moved it to that uh, portion of our ministry, and, and so now most of what we do on Sundays and Thursdays is preaching, but we're going to do some, uh, run a lot of references and verses this evening. We have read to you from chapter 2 and chapter 4, uh, prophecies, two separate prophecies, the word of the Lord that came to Micah, chapter 1, verse 1, and then uh, God uh, sends a word uh, to him again in uh, chapters uh, 3 and 4, and so the two prophecies, both of them regarding the restoration and regathering of Israel, this is necessary because of the, the scattering and dispersion of Israel, which uh, made it necessary. And so we're going to look tonight at the verses uh, as to why God scattered the people off the land and how God will bring them back. And just uh, we, we preached on this Sunday morning, Sunday night. We're going to run some cross-references and supporting scriptures together this evening. So let's pray. Father, uh, bless your word tonight. We've come hoping to hear from you and learn of you and, and from you and pray, God, that you would guide us and direct us into some truth that would be helpful and beneficial to us this evening. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name and amen. All right, chapter 2 and verse 6. Prophesy ye not, say they to them that prophesy. They shall not prophesy to them that they shall not take shame. So the people are in such a condition that they do not want preachers preaching to them because they want to do what is wrong in the eyes of God without being told it's wrong in the eyes of God because they don't want to be put to shame by the preaching of the Word of God. Uh, you live in a, in a country that is, is full, full bore practicing as, uh, Micah chapter 2 and verse number 5. It is now a shame for you to put someone to shame for their misconduct. The misconduct is not shameful. The person who points out the misconduct is shameful. And the Bible says in verse number, uh, uh, sorry, chapter 2, verse 6, and the Bible says in verse 7, O thou that art named the house of Jacob, is the Spirit of the Lord straightened? Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly. So here's what they've done. Uh, here, here, here is the Spirit of the Lord, and the Spirit of the Lord encompasses all of the truth of the Word of God. And these people don't want to walk in all the truth of the Word of God. And so what they've done is they have, they have straightened, put in a straight place. The New Testament used the word constrained the Holy Spirit and said, the Holy Spirit is only concerned about these sins. And here's all this righteousness the Holy Spirit calls for, and they narrow the thing down and say, no, no, the Holy Spirit only calls for, for this to be righteous. And again, very modern, very up-to-date, very American church in the day and time in which you live, we love the Lord. We're keeping all of God's commandments. The four of them we haven't thrown away. And we love the Lord. We're doing all God asks us to do the three things we've decided we want to do. And, and they've thrown everything else out. I, I remember uh, speaking with a couple one time and they attended a church that taught, that taught that if you sinned, you lost your salvation. And I started pointing out things in the Bible that they were supposed to do that they weren't doing and things in the Bible they weren't supposed to do that they were doing. And they told me that their pastor, in, in, through much Bible study and prayer, had determined that there were really only five sins. And as long as you didn't commit one of those five sins, that you wouldn't lose your salvation. Now, what is that? That's a man straightening the Spirit of God, restricting the Spirit of God so that, yes, indeed, there are things that displease the Lord, but they aren't anything that I would ever do. And most people live by that, that creed today, whether in the church or out of the church. I cannot tell. And so look, look with me to Psalm 77. Let's try that one. Psalm number 77. Psalm 77. You want, you want a Holy Spirit that reigns in your conduct. You do not want a Holy Spirit that 
allows you to rein in his conduct. Psalm 77, verse number 7. Will the Lord cast off forever, and will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Doth his promise fail forevermore? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Selah, that's the question that's asked. Think about that. Isaiah 59, let's go there. Isaiah 59. And then we'll see the verses to which these are leading in Micah. Isaiah 59, verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So, back to Micah, coming back to Micah quickly while these verses are still in our minds. The Bible says in verse number 7, O thou that art named the house of Jacob, so they, they still claim to be the people of God, is the Spirit of the Lord straightened, limited by you? Well, Isaiah would say, no, the arm of the Lord, Lord is not shortened. The psalmist said, well, then, then why is he not saving us? And Isaiah says, because you won't give up your iniquities. And the people in Micah, Micah and Isaiah, same, prophesying the same time period, the people would say to Micah, but our preachers told us we're not sinning. But our preachers told us that we're, we're right with God. And Micah says, and the psalmist says, and Isaiah says, well, then why is God driving you out of your land, which he said he would allow you to dwell in if you did right, and which he said he would drive you out of if you did wrong, because you're doing wrong. And the people begin to whine and post things on, on Facebook and social media about how hateful and mean-spirited Micah is and what a bigot he is and what a legalist he is and how he just doesn't have any love. And Lord, so you can keep talking that way all you want. You're going to end up in captivity. You're going to end up in bondage. You're going to end up scattered to the ends of the earth for 2,000 years. You won't be able to set foot in your homeland if you, if you keep that up. And... So God answers in verse number 7, as he did in Isaiah, Do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly. So there are blessings of God spelled out in his word, but there are things that God expects of people in order for, for them to receive those blessings. And the people in Micah's day had been deceived by their ministers into thinking God had removed the conditions that he placed upon them, but would not remove the blessings. And so when the blessings disappeared, the people are confused because well, they're still claiming the name of Jacob, they still think they're the people of God, and they're still going to religious uh, services, and yet they've lost the blessing of the Lord upon their lives, and they're confused. They're confused because they put more trust in their lying preachers than they do in the Bible, in the Scriptures, in the Word of God. And that's, you see that happening across our land today. Now, an example of, of some of their misconduct, look at verse number 8 and 9. Even of late my people has risen up as an enemy. Ye pull off the robe with a garment from them that pass by securely as men averse from war. The women of my people have ye cast out of their pleasant houses. From their children have ye taken away my glory Forever. Now, the reference here the, to the legal statute is back in Exodus 22, and let's, let's go there, Exodus chapter 22. I think this is the right place. Yeah, Exodus 22 and verse number 26. If thou at all take thy neighbor's raiment to pledge... Thou shalt deliver it unto him by that the sun goeth down. For that is his covering only, it is his raiment for his skin, wherein shall he sleep. And it shall come to pass when he crieth unto me that I will hear, for I am gracious. So God commanded the people not to reduce a man to the place where he was so poor that all he had were the clothes on his back, and then you went beyond that and took the clothes from off his back. And the Lord said, I don't want you to, to uh, reduce the, uh, the fatherless and the widow to a place where you've driven them out of their homes, they have no roof over their head. 
And in Micah's day, they were doing those things and wondering why God wasn't blessing them. Now again, Micah is not written in the United States, and the United States is not the nation of Israel. But those of you that are my age and younger, if a man was a full-on, unrestrained drunkard, he might spend a night or two in the gutter on his way home. You have lived to see the day in this country when every city and town in America is populated by people who have nothing but the clothes on their back, they have no roof over their head, and no one seems to know how it happened, and no one seems to know how to, how to get out from under that situation. And the Lord says, I'll tell you what your problem is. You keep listening to lying preachers who tell you you're right with God. That's what he said. Now you can say, well, it's a drug problem. You can say it's an economic problem. You can say it's a border problem. You can say it's an overpopulation problem. You can say it's a lack of education problem. You can say it's a bad government problem. Yes, but here's what nobody can say. This is how you fix it. And the reason nobody can say this is how you fix it is because anybody with a Bible and the Word of God is not allowed to participate in the conversation. We can tell you how to fix it. It might take a few years, but we can tell you how to fix it. Because back when the nation was, was under the influence of the Word of God, it didn't say it was a Christian nation. When the nation was under the influence of the Word of God, you didn't have this problem. When you replace the Word of God, the influence of the Word of God, with the influence of evolution in the schools and Hollywood in the home. And when church and the Bible became unnecessary and mocked and ridiculed, now all you can do is stand there and say, we just got a big problem on our hands and the problems seem to be getting worse and we, we just don't seem to know what to do about the problem. And you're not going to know what to do about the problem because you threw God out. And without God, you can hand a guy 20 bucks to buy drugs with, it ain't going to help you, it ain't going to help him. That's a fact, and you're just going to have more and more uh, people without homes and more and more people without a means to provide for themselves and more and more people just wandering the streets and, and living in, in desolation, and they don't know how to get out of it, and nobody knows how to get them out of it, and it's, it's just a disaster. And the Lord says, the problem is you're not right with God and your preachers are lying too when they tell you it's not a spiritual problem because it is a spiritual problem. That's a fact. There's only one way off drugs, and that's the power of the Holy Ghost. Only one way off the bottle, it's the power of the Holy Ghost. There's only one way out of all these broken homes and busted marriages, and it's the power of the Holy Ghost. And there's only one way out of this, this perverse confusion on the part of your, your leaders from, from the lowest level to the highest level, and that's the Holy Ghost of God and the Word of God, and nobody wants that. Okay, not, not nobody. Apart from a little group of people like you, it's not welcome. And the Lord says, well, okay, so just keep scratching your heads and wondering what went wrong. Well, take a look at verse number 10. How are we doing so far? We, Arise ye and depart. This is real interesting here. Arise ye and depart, for this is not your rest, because it is polluted, it shall destroy you, even with a sore destruction. So here's what we covered Sunday morning, Sunday night. God promised land to Abraham, big piece of land, Nile to the Euphrates River, all the way up into modern day Turkey, the, the, what we call the Middle East, all that belongs to Abraham. Then to Isaac, then to Jacob, then to the 12 uh, sons uh, of Jacob, 12 tribes of Israel, that land belongs to them. And you can fight all the wars you want to, and you can sign all the documents you want to, and you can start all the religions you want to. That land belongs to them. God said so. Now, what, what, what happened over the centuries is they fell in love with the land, but cared nothing for the God who gave them the land. Their identity became that piece of real estate, not the fact that they belonged to the Lord. And they thought as long as they were in the land, they had rest, 
And if they weren't in the land, they need to get back to the land because only then could they have rest. And so God sends this preacher, Micah, and, and the other prophets, to, and here's what he says. You may as well pack your bags and leave now because though you are in the land, you are not in your rest because I will never let you rest in this land until you acknowledge me as your God and the proof that you acknowledge me as your God is you will obey the law that I gave you. And to this day, there's been, you know, 10 years here, 20 years there, one king here, one revival there, but by and large... In the 4,500 years that, since God gave the children of Israel the law and brought them into that land, they couldn't care less what he said. All they want is that land. And when an enemy comes and they think they're going to get driven off the land, all of a sudden they start saying prayers and holding special services, you know, and putting up monuments where the Twin Towers fell and all that kind of stuff. But as soon as, as, soon as the, the enemy backs off, they just forget all about God. And he said, well, he'll carry him to captivity. That'll get him right. He carried him into Babylon, and they're down in Babylon marrying Babylonish women and worshiping the false gods of Babylon. Nothing seems to work. And so, so he says, uh, rise, ye depart. This is not your rest. Now, let's look at some uh, references here along, along these lines. Let's go to Numbers chapter 10. Numbers chapter 10. This is uh, children of Israel wandering in the wilderness between deliverance from Egypt and the promised land. Numbers 10 and verse number 33. And they departed from the mount of the Lord three days journey and the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them in the three days journey to search out a resting place for them. So while they're in the wilderness on the way to the promised land, being led by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, the presence of the Lord going before them in, in the Ark of the Covenant or upon the Ark of the Covenant or with the Ark of the Covenant, what are they seeking? What's God seeking for them? A place of rest. Place of rest. Now, come to Deuteronomy chapter 12. Next book over, Deuteronomy chapter 12. And verse number 1. Well, let's start at verse, verse number 1. These are the statutes and judgments which ye shall observe to do in the land, which the Lord God of the fathers giveth thee to possess it, all the days that ye live upon the earth. Now, you, you see the order? Here's the rules when you get the land. What did they want? Forget the rules, just give us the land. Verse number two, ye shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods upon the high mountains, upon the hills, and under every green tree. Ye shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars and burn their groves with fire. And ye shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place. Ye shall not do so unto the Lord your God. So he should get rid of everything that belongs to any other God or any other religion or any other way of worship and just worship me. They never did it. And if they were forced during times of revival by a Josiah or a Hezekiah or a David to clean up their act, as soon as that man died, here comes Solomon building houses of worship for all his heathen wives, and here comes another king right after him to, to bring all the junk back in. And so look what verse 5 says. But under the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither thou shalt come, and thither ye shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes and heath offerings of your hand and your vows and your freewill offerings and the firstlings of your herds and of your flocks, and there ye shall eat before the Lord your God, and ye shall rejoice in all that ye put your hand unto, ye and your households, wherein the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. Ye shall not do after all the things that we do here this day. Every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes, for ye are not as yet come to the rest and to the inheritance which the Lord your God giveth you. Now look what he said. We're going to go over Jordan 
and we're going to clean that place out, and that'll be your rest if you clean the place out. But if you, if you live over there like you're living over here, you're never going to have any rest. And what do you rebuke them for? Doing what they thought was right instead of what God said was right. See what he told them? You got no rest here. You're wandering around the wilderness. You know why you got no rest here? Because you want to do what's right in your own eyes, not obey the statutes that I wrote for you. And if you get over there in that land and you live over there like you're living over here, you won't have any rest there either. Now, you can enjoy your days and enjoy the works of your hands and enjoy your families and your homes and your property, and, but only if you obey my commandments. What he said. Now, so what, what was happening in Micah's day? They were doing what was right in their own eyes, not what God said. But they had ministers encouraging them to sin. How do you feel about it? How did God speak to your heart? Can, can I say something without saying, uh, this is going to sound like total heresy. It's not total heresy at all. If God said, thou shalt not commit adultery, you don't have to pray about it. If God said, thou shalt not steal, you don't have to pray about it. I am so sick and tired of people sinning and they tell me, well, I prayed about it and, and the Lord told me, you don't have to pray about it. In fact, don't pray about it because you'll deceive yourself or an unclean spirit will deceive you. If God told you not to do something, there's no need to pray. If God told you to do something, there's no need to pray. The only reason you're praying instead of obeying is you don't want to obey. That's good preaching, preacher. I, I, I agree with that. So you got all these preachers, you know, and these people come to preachers and say, well, you know, I met this woman at work, and I know I'm married and all, but I'm kind of in love with her. And the preacher says, well, well how do you feel about it when you talk to God about it? The guy's a devil. He's, he's, that's what Micah's preaching against. Well, you know, I, I don't go to that church anymore because, you know, I, I, I just, they, they just, they were so judgmental and, and so, so critical of what I wanted to do. And I, I found a church now where people really love, they love, they love God and they love me and they love my boyfriend and they love my other boyfriend and they, they, they don't love my ex-husband because he was mean to me when I got my boyfriend. And, and, but I just, I just think we just should love. And You've been lied to for so long that you can't even remember the last time somebody told you the truth. And that's, that's what's going on here. So, um, everybody happy so far? I'm, I'm happy. hope you're happy. Leviticus chapter 18. Let's go there. Leviticus chapter 18. I'm a third of the way through one of four pages, if that encourages you. Leviticus 18. We got all summer, people. We got all, all summer. Leviticus 18, verse 24. Defile not yourselves in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled which I cast out before you, and the land is defiled, therefore do I, I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. And, and we won't read the chapter, but what, what they're engaged, the Canaanites were engaged in is pretty much all the sexual deviation, uh, deviance that your country today is embracing and involved in. And so the Lord said to the children of Israel, here, here, look, you see those people? I'm going to drive them off that land because of the evil things they're doing. And I'm going to put you in that land. And if you start doing what they were doing, do you think I'm going to treat you any differently? I will drive you off the land just like I drove them off the land. Now this is a good time to say something I've been wanting to say for a long time. If you don't, if you don't understand from the Bible that Israel is a nation from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the church 
is born again people who trusted Jesus Christ their Savior, here's what you're going to do. You're going to think that the church, your church, is Israel. And you're going to get, for example, you're going to get on boats and come to the new world and drive the people off the land or enslave them or disease them or try to exterminate them because they're Canaanites. And what makes you think they're Canaanites? Well, because contrary to what you saw in the Disney movies and learned in the public school, they are a really vile bunch of sexual deviants whose tribes never get beyond 1,000 or 5,000 at the most because what they do for fun is not play football or basketball. They have wars. And they torture each other and scalp each other and kill each other. So if you were Christians, you would come over here and win them to Jesus Christ. But if you were Calvinists or Papists or Protestants who thought you were Old Testament Israel, you would come over here and try to kill all of them and take their land. You would enslave some that didn't look like you because, after all, you're the chosen race. <laughs> and 200, 300, 400, 500 years later, we'd still be having to tell people on Church Street in Orlando on the boardwalk in Daytona Beach, being white doesn't make you a Jew, you moron. <laughs> Two entirely different groups of people. And we still have to apologize when we witness to people because they think Christianity brought slaves to America. No, people that thought they were Israel and, and Christians at the same time found some stuff in the Old Testament about enslaving people that came from Ham, you bunch of dummies. You make it so difficult for people to witness to the lost. Well, you know, the Christians did this in the Crusades, and no, the Catholic Church did that because they thought they were Israel and wanted their land back, and it was never their land to start with. You'd bunch of dummies. It's frustrating. We get blamed for stuff, and we're the only ones that never did it. <laughs> Bible-believing Christians never did that stuff. Catholics get away with it, and the Protestants get away with it, and we get blamed for it. How's that? Baptist, the Baptists never formed an army and said, let's go get kill everybody that doesn't look like us, and let's go take territory and land. That's the Pope, the church that never excommunicated Hitler. All those Nazis were Roman Catholics. Mussolini's were Roman Catholic. None of them ever got excommunicated. Local priests might say they can't have communion, but all they got to do is get on a plane and fly over to the Vatican. The Pope will give them communion. <laughs> Nothing changes, people. Nothing changes. But just stick with the Bible. It, 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 it'll always come back around every time. All right, so look what he says. Verse, uh, Leviticus 18, is that where we are? Sorry, moms, you're going to have to go home now and, and go through the whole dummy thing. And we don't call people dummies. And just say, son, pray that God will call you to preach, and, and then you'll be able to say it. <laughs> Verse 26, ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any of your own nation, nor any stranger that sojourneth among you. For all these abominations have the, men, have the men of the land done, which were before you, and the land is, land is defiled, that, la, that the land spew not you out also when ye defile it, as it spewed out the nations which were before you. See that? So Micah's telling them, you guys think you're going to stay in this land forever when you're living like you're living? God's no respecter of persons. All right, um, Psalm 95. Psalm number 95, Psalm 95, Psalm 95, verse 8. 
Harden not your heart as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation, and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath, look at it, that they should not enter into my rest. Had God given them a promised land? He had. Did they get to enjoy it? No. Why not? Because their misconduct kept them, kept them short of it. We're not talking about salvation going to heaven here. Uh, Psalm 132, let's try that one. Psalm 132. And verse number 7, or 8, 8, 8. Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou in the ark of thy strength. Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness, and let thy saints shout for joy. For thy servant David's sake, turn not away the face of thine anointed. The Lord has sworn in truth unto David. He will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. That's in Micah 5. We're going to talk about that, Lord, when on Sunday morning. It all, it all matches up. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I should teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne forevermore. For the Lord had chosen Zion, he desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. So, see what they do? God says, that, that's the place where I'm going to rest forever. But they skipped over the whole part about, in the meantime, if you're righteous, I'll let you rest there. And if you're not righteous, I'll throw you out because I'm not going to sit around here in the midst of all this unrighteousness. And this is my land. It's not your land. It's my land. So you want to live here with me? You're going to have to live my way. And that's, that's what we got to in, in chapter 4 the other night that we're not going to get to tonight uh, unless you want to stick around a while. And, uh, anyway, um, <laughs> so when Christ comes back and sets up his kingdom of righteousness, when sin is not tolerated and not practiced openly, then there will be rest. But until there's righteousness in that land, the Lord's not going to settle down there and stay there. Look at Hebrews chapter 4. Let's go there, Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews 4. Verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works, and in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore, which was hard to see in the verse you just read, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief, again he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, for if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So stop there for a minute. So God, children of Israel are in Egypt. Here's a promised land. God says, put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. They did that. I'll bring you out. He did that. Now let's go to the promised land. They said, no, no, we, no, no. It's, what, what, oh, just cross over and I'll, I'll smite all your, no, no, there's giants over there. We don't want to go. The Lord said, okay, there's a rest, but you're going to wander out here for 40 years until you all die. Not because there wasn't a rest, but because you wouldn't believe me and obey me and enter into that rest. So who did Joshua 
lead Jesus, Joshua, who did, who did he lead into that rest? Two people that believed. Everybody else came short of it. Now, the Lord fast forwards. Did you hear the gospel? Oh, yeah. Did you trust the blood of the Lamb? Oh, yeah. Well, not heaven, not heaven. On earth, there is a place of rest that you can enjoy with me if you will obey me. If you won't enter into that rest, you will wander around out here until you die and say, well, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. I mean, the Lord isn't as good as I thought he was going to be. Well, getting saved isn't what all those people said it was. No, you're just trapped in the wilderness because you don't want to obey God. And the people that are obeying him and living by his word, they're sitting over there saying, man, this is great. Why don't you come on over? No, you bunch of fanatics. They're trying to take away all our fun and all joy. Well, just keep wandering around and dying. That's what he's telling them. So, in, interesting uh, material there. Uh, I think if you don't, we'll move right on here. Um, Micah chapter 2, let's go back there. Micah chapter 2. Uh, again, let's, let's bring it up to our day. I don't. I don't recommend you do. I have, briefly, is all I could take, but you get to this, this Benny Hinn crowd and whoever it is that's on, on the religious TV now, these, these, they used to be charismatics, they don't even try to push the gifts anymore. Now it's just all prosperity and wealth and healing and prayer of Jabez and, and uh, all that kind of nonsense. You know what they're telling you? Do you want all the blessings of God without any of those nasty commandments of God? Just watch me. Because we're all blessings 24 hours a day and no mean judgmental preaching. You don't have to give up anything. You can enlarge your coasts. You don't have to give up anything. The blessings will fall down out of it. That is the same lie that the preachers were telling in Micah's day. The material blessings from God without obedience to God and without loyalty to God, that's the lie that Micah rebukes. And I kind of know how he felt. Like, where are the rest of the preachers? How come nobody else is crying out against this? And they get fewer and fewer all the time. Well, you know, God's really blessing that church. How do you know? Well, they got 900 people down there. How'd they get them? By only telling them what they wanted to hear. Promised land without commandments. Blessing of God and Christ as king without obedience to his majesty. And Micah said, Lord, going to come here and he's going to bust this whole thing to pieces. He's going to spew you out. And isn't that what he said in Revelation? You're rich. You're increased with goods. You have need of nothing. You call yourself a church and Christ is on the outside trying to get in and God's going to spew you out of his mouth. Mm -mm -mm. You are so negative. You are so critical. <laughs> have you not seen anything this past week somebody needs to criticize? From a Bible, not from a political standpoint? Well, let's see what else we got here. Verse number 11. If a man walking in the Spirit, see the little s there? And falsehood. So it would be either his own spirit, it's just a human spirit, humanist, or an unclean spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit. Man walking the spirit and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine of strong drink. He shall even be the prophet of this people. Well, let's find a church, honey. Uh, you pick one. I picked the last one. Well, no, let's, let's find out what, what the, the kids want to go. What a genius. What a genius. <laughs> Parents letting their teenage children pick the house of worship they're going to attend. Were you never a teenager? It, it's amazing people get to be adults and forget what it was like to be a teenager. God's going to give you some one day to remind you. Uh, 
And the wife doesn't let the husband pick the church because he picked one and she made him leave it because the preacher preached the Bible. Um, oh, can't believe you said that. I can't believe I've had to live through it so many times. So what are they looking for? They're looking for a preacher who tells them that God's cool with drinking. Well, you know, as long as you don't lose strong, no, he said wine and strong drink. So he threw in the soft stuff and the hard stuff. So you guys that think you're not sinning, if, if the proof's not as high. Or it's a no, no, both of it, both of it. You, you can write me all the emails and letters and notes you want to. I've read every place in the Bible where somebody drank alcohol, and I can't, I can't find a place where it turned out well. God saved Noah from a flood. And about half a gallon is all it took for him to ruin his home and his family. That's something, ain't it? Enough water to cover the earth 15 cubits higher than the highest mountain didn't mess up Noah and his family. But a couple of bottles of booze was all it took. I don't know why people try to, why do you try to justify stuff? Isn't there enough to drink without drinking something questionable? Even if, it's, if you, I mean, you, you got to admit, it, at best it's questionable. There, you can't find anything to quench your thirst that, that doesn't bring your testimony into question, doesn't cause you to have to argue against everybody preaches the Bible. Why would you do that? Well, Jesus said one and one. Okay, and you get up there, he's serving booze, you drink it there. Down here, he said not look at it. That's what he said. All right. Anyway, but if if they can find a lying preacher, verse number uh, 6, and a drinking preacher, verse number 11, he shall even be the prophet of this people. So sinners are looking for preachers who won't condemn, find fault with, criticize, preach against their sins. That's, that's pretty obvious. You want some really good verses out of the Bible? Good, I thought you did. Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5. Check this out, as they say down at the library. Verse 30. Jeremiah 5, verse number 30. A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. Wonderful, that means, whoa, look at that. Horrible meaning, I wish I hadn't seen that. Wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. That's bad. And the priests bear rule by their means. That means the church, the denomination, they just make up the rules. They don't go by God's word. They just make up their own rules. And my people love to have it so. Lord said, I am amazed. My land, my nation, my people. And they want a preacher that doesn't tell the truth. And they want a, a, a church, a religion that just makes up junk because they don't want to go by the Bible. And the Lord says, and what will you do in the end thereof? I don't know where America's headed because America's not Israel and Jeremiah's not written to America, but if, if if God sacked his own chosen people for doing that stuff, you, you better be real concerned about where your country's headed. Ezekiel 13. Ezekiel chapter 13. So here's what happens. It wouldn't happen here, but, but it happens other places. I go place uh, and I preach stuff like this. And people say, oh, that's, so, that's such a downer. That's so depressing. That makes me feel so bad. And then they go home and watch news channels. And go home and get on the internet and go to go to... Well, you know, my, my, the, my sources really tell the truth. Yeah, but, but 
they're saying, they're saying things are wrong. I'm saying things are wrong. I'm telling you how to fix them. They're just telling you how bad it is. Why does preaching depress you and the news doesn't depress you? Why do people hope the preacher doesn't go an hour, but they, they watch this news stuff all day long? It's bizarre to me. I don't understand it. I just need to keep up with what's going on. Why? You can't keep up. Ezekiel 13, verse number 3. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. How's that? So you got a guy that with a uh, doctorate in theology and he can't find the virgin birth in the Bible. And people sitting there in that church and paying him. He's got a car, he's got a parsonage, he's got insurance, he's got a pension, he's got a salary. And he can't find the virgin birth in the Bible. Here's some guy that's been to, been to seminary, been to Bible school, and, and he, 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 can't, in the, he cannot find in the Bible that nobody ever sprinkled a baby. Isn't that odd? You th- I mean, you think just... just if you, if you can't read it, just listen to Scorby. He'll read it to you. And find one place in there where somebody sprinkled water on a baby's forehead and said it made him a Christian. Where did people come up with that stuff? And you've got entire denominations full of preachers and deacons and deaconesses and bishops and, and all that kind of stuff. And they'd say no, they, can't, they can't see anything. Are you saved? What does that mean? Saved? How, well, how, how can you know you're saved? Nobody knows they're saved till, they're, till after they die. And you're a minister? Yeah. And people go to you for counseling? And you can't even see the way to get out of hell and into heaven? It's amazing, isn't it? Right. And our crowd, you know, our crowd. We, we got a Bible. We, we, bless God, we believe the Bible. We believe the good old King James Bible. Well, how come the last ten sermons you preached have been something you thought while you were in the shower? Some vision you saw driving down the road. God, God, God laid this on my heart last night, and God told me to preach about tennis shoes. And <laughs> the Lord said, Man, you you had seen anything. I didn't show you any of that stuff. What are you preaching that stuff? I didn't show you that stuff. I gave you 66 book in the Bible. Why don't you preach that sometime? Uh, Hosea chapter 9. Hosea chapter number 9. Hosea 9. I just like the Bible. It just, it just makes me feel good when I read it, and it calms my nerves when I read it. Okay, here's a verse to make you feel good and call your nerves. Hosea 9, 7. The days of visitation are come, the days of recompense are come. Israel shall know it. The prophet is a fool. The spiritual man is mad for the multitude of thine iniquity and the great hatred. You know God said the haters are? The preachers and the people that hate the Bible. The fools and the madmen that hate the Word of God. How about that? You know what the Lord says? It, Lord, it, there's the people walking around, and Hosea says, uh, where are you going? Oh, we're going down to the, to the Sabbath service. Oh, yeah, who's the rabbi down there? And, and they tell him the name, and, and Hosea says, yeah, God says he's a fool. <laughs> what? <laughs> God said your priest is a fool. Amen. They meet somebody, where are you going? Oh, we're going down to the synagogue. Oh, yeah, who said, who's leading the synagogue service down there? Oh, rabbi so-and-so. Hosea says, yeah, God says he's a madman. It's cuckoo. He's out of his mind. Oh, you're so mean. You're so hateful. You're so critical. You're so narrow-minded. You're such a bigot. You're a hater. 
And Hosea says, no, no, you, you guys are the ones full of hate. Yes, sir. You hate God, you hate the Bible, you hate me, you hate yourselves, you're destroying yourselves. Your families are falling apart, you're on drugs, you're on psych meds, your kids don't know if they're a boy or a girl, and you're calling us haters. You hate your life. You hate what you look like, you hate your gender, you hate your nation, you hate your parents, you hate your government, you hate the people that are trying to tell you how to be saved so you wouldn't have to be so full of hate. Yes, sir. And you're calling the only happy people you ever encounter haters. You know what the Lord said? You're mad. You're fools. Hmm. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, come on back to Micah chapter 2. How much more of this? <laughs> I can go all night. <laughs> Heart's feeling better, voices back. Let's just lay the ax to the root of the trees, man. Just chop the thing down, throw it in the fire. Micah chapter 2, verse number 12. Now, look how merciful God is. New paragraph. I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as the sheep of Basra, as the flock in the midst of their fold. They shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. You know what God said? He said, I promised Abraham that his children would be as the sand of the sea and the stars of the heaven, and I would bring them into the land that I swear to their fathers, and I would give them the land from the Nile to the Euphrates all the way up into modern-day Turkey. And I just want you to know, no matter how long you push this back and push it back and push it back, and no matter how difficult you make it on yourselves for century after century after century, I'm going to do it. Yeah. I'm going to do it. If, if we have to bury a thousand generations of rebels. I am not going to give up until I have a remnant in the wilderness of Basra hidden in the mountains that will do what I ask them to do and I will lead them into that land and be their king and sit on that throne. I'll fulfill every one of my promises. You're not going to make a liar out of God. You're just going to miss out on the good stuff. The breaker is come up before them. It's the only time in the Bible God is, is referred to by this name. The breakers come up before them. They have broken up and have passed through the gate and are gone out by it. And their king shall pass before them and the Lord on the head of them. See, what I was going to do is I was going to run through that, all that negative stuff and then finish up tonight on this really cool stuff about how the Lord is going to break the armies at Megiddo and break the Antichrist and break through the Eastern Gate and break the stronghold of the Antichrist religion and lead the faithful in and sit on the throne and establish the kingdom. But you guys kept thinking, how much more of this? How much more of this? So we, we, can't do the, we can't do the good part tonight because you fainted, by the way. And, we, and we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to pick up there and do the... Do the good stuff next time. But here's what's, here's what's great about God. And this is what this, all those passages about rest in Hebrews, here's, here's what he said. We're going to get there. You want to be part of it or not? If you want to be part of it, you can be. If you don't want to be part of it, I'll spew you out or scatter you or, or you die in your sins, whatever the case might be. But I'm going to do everything I said I'd do. And I just want to kind of get in and, and fall in line with the Lord and, and enjoy all, all that good stuff. So, so here's, give me four minutes. You know what's over there? Clusters of grapes so large, two men with a pole. It takes two men with a pole to carry a cluster of grapes. It's a land flowing, flowing with milk and honey. That means it's green grass and flowers as far as the eye can see. That's where you get honey. Flowers. Yes, sir. 
fruit trees blossoming. Every man sitting under his vine and sitting under his fig tree. That's what's over there. And the people are dying in the wilderness saying, why can't we drink wine? What's wrong with drinking wine? You will die pouring the last drop out of a bottle when you could sit under a vine and under a fig tree in grass up to your calves. People are so deceived. All these rules, all these commandments, all these regulations. Why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? Okay, end up living in the woods, standing on a corner with a cardboard sign, begging for 20 bucks to feed your addiction, but nobody's going to tell you what to do. And you live in a town where people strung out on addictions live in the woods, walk past, track passing, street preaching people who would lead them to Jesus Christ to go down to a liberal church that gives them a meal and not the Bible and sends them back out into the woods. And they're the nice guys with love, and we're the mean-spirited, hateful people. You know what the Lord said? You bunch of fools and madmen, you're crazy. That's what he said. Because you'd rather, you'd rather live and die in your sin than listen to somebody tell you it's sin. How sad. How sad. So... Lace up your shoes, tighten your belt. It's only going to get worse, and then we're out of here. Yeah. Woo! Might be today. Oh, I, not not today. I, I'm going to do this thing for the Fourth of July. I'm going to say, okay, Monday. Well, <laughs> Lord's like, really? <laughs> I'm offering you the rapture, and you don't want to miss fireworks. <laughs> it's like. We come back, I'll show you fireworks like you've never seen. <laughs> anyway, that's, um, all right, so that's, uh, oh, wow, I'm sorry. One, two, three. That's half of four pages. I'm not coming back then. Well, I'm not going to tell you when we're going to do the others. So we'll just. All right, Sunday morning, invite a friend, invite a coworker, invite a loved one. We're going to uh, show you from Micah 5. The promise of the virgin birth and the coming of the Messiah into the world to, to save sinners. Yeah, it won't be a Christmas message. It'll be a birth of Christ message. The, the, the two are different. Um, <laughs> well, I never knew that. Well, you've never been to a place like this. Uh,